of our jobs to Him. Come, Holy Ghost, we are thy faithful, and the children of thy divine love, send forth thy spirit in our jobs greedy. And our renewed with thy city. Let us pray, O God, to this truck back to thy faithful. By the light of the Holy Ghost, we have the gifts of the same spirit. May we be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, for Christ the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, see the wisdom of pray the Lord. Pray for us. Pray, pray for us. us. Amen. All right. Welcome back, smaller crowd. Maybe they heard the topic was going to be sin. Um, no, oh, that doesn't exist, but uh, <laughs> so the uh, we looked last time at conscience. We looked at conscience. Um, we saw its importance. We saw what it is and what it's not. How we said that conscience is not just a kind of a, another faculty of the soul. Um, it's an act of the soul. It's a practical. It's an act of practical judgment of the soul. It's an application of the general principles to a concrete situation. Um, so remember the example was that what the what the punch is to the fist, conscience is to the intellect. All right? the, the, the fist is there, the intellect is there, but when it does a certain action, we call it conscience. And it's a practical moral judgment. So it's a judgment about some sort of moral matter, um, good or bad, and it's practical. It's not just a general theory. You know, would it be good to kill? Would it be good to? It's not. In my, is this, is this sin or not? Right. So that's what we talked about when we talked about conscience, and we had said that it's um well it's of extreme importance because a certain conscience must be obeyed. If it's a certain conscience, if we're sure of something. And our conscience tells us this is this must be done or this must be avoided. Um, if our conscience tells us that we have a, if it's a certain if we're certain about it, we have an obligation to follow that. And yet we know that our conscience, uh, because it's a practical moral judgment, we can be very certain about something that is incorrect. We can be very certain about something and still be incorrect about it. Right, in our judgment. Or we can make false judgments. It's just the way it is. So these days, of course, they push conscience, 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 you do whatever your conscience says, but without really talking about the fact that our conscience can be wrong. Our, our conscience can be malformed. And so that's when we have to couple this insistence on the conscience being followed with an insistence on the conscience is not enough on its own. It needs be formed from outside. It needs to be formed by, by God's teachings. It needs to be formed by divine revelation. Uh, there are certain things that are written in the very nature of, of man. That's true. Most of the Ten Commandments, most of the Ten Commandments are written right into the soul. Um, why do I say most? Because there's one of the Ten Commandments that, at least specifically, the, the, the specification is not written on the heart of Thou shalt keep holy the Lord's day. It would be it's written in man's heart that we have to give some time to God, but then we have to give one day every seven. That's something that God revealed. It's not something that we that would we, we would have known on our own. We would have known we would have would have, we would have known that we would have to worship God. We would have known that we would have to give some time to God. But how often? What day of the week? <coughs> We wouldn't have known that if God hadn't told us. There are other things um, that also are essential for salvation, but that our nature couldn't tell us. For example, is having water poured over your head with certain words being said, is that a good right or a bad right? R-I-T-E. Right? Is it a good rubric or a bad rubric? I guess it depends on who revealed it. Jesus Christ revealed it. He's the Son of God. And it's a good rubric. Right? But you have all these other false religions that have their rights, and they're evil. And they have to be avoided. 
because they don't come from God. So baptism, for example, and the other sacraments, we know they're good because God has told us. God has formed our conscience. And we have, by God's grace, we've received that formation. So we have to continue to, um, to inform the conscience. We cannot just say, well, I feel this way, therefore I'm just going to live that way, period. I feel like this. It's not about feelings. It's a practical, moral judgment based on what God and the nature God has given us and what he has revealed. Um, all right. Now we go on to the question of sin. So what about, now you might say, well, if I, if my conscience is properly formed and I know what's right and wrong, then all the problems are solved. It's going to be easy to get to heaven. There's no way I'm going to lose my soul because I know the laws. Ah, knowledge and action are two different things. We can, and we all know it, we can know very well the law and still choose to break it. We can make a, a rule at home perfectly clear to the child and still find the child doing it moments later. And we often can be the same way. So it shouldn't be that way, but it can. It can happen. And that's what we call sin. All right? It's quite simply disobedience to God's law. All right? So in other words, knowledge is not enough. We're capable of knowing and still disobeying. Sin is a breaking of God's law, and the whole enormity of sin, the whole you know, the terrible um, reality of sin is tied up in the fact that it is a breaking of God's law. It's not just any law, it's a breaking of God's law. Almighty God has made this law, and I break it. In that sense, every sin is a huge deal. Now, there is a real difference between venial sin and mortal sin. And we often say, well, venial sin is a lesser sin. It is. Relative to mortal sin, venial sin is a lesser sin. But let's not think that venial sin is just some sort of silly mistake or some sort of you know, little thing. In itself, because venial sin is a moral evil, it is worse than the greatest plague or forest fire, or fire in a city, or you know, explosion that kills thousands of people. And it's, those are physical evils. Even a venial sin is a moral evil in itself. Every moral evil outweighs every physical evil. It's of a different order. And so we can't think that, oh, some sort of a you know, venial sin is not a big deal. It's not going to it's not going to be so great that you would lose your soul. But it is something that we have to take seriously. Uh, that's why I would say it's a big mistake to, and, and this can be, a, it, it can happen. We can get souls that, that because they're facing some major struggles, they're, they're, they can begin to neglect any real look at the venial sins in their life. And so they'll be faithful, let's say, to confessing their grave sins in the confessional, but hardly give a look to, to the venial sin. That's a big mistake. Because typically, if we're falling into grave sin, it's because we're already on the edge. We, the, the venial sins are already so frequent that we're so weak that we keep falling. You're typically not going to be able to fix the the problem of mortal sin if you don't at the same time address the problem of deliberate venial sin. All right, so what do we mean by deliberate venial sin? This is something that when it comes to, um, for example, teaching, when it comes to the tests for the first communicants, it's always interesting. The little one, the little children come in and the priest rolls up his sleeves and starts quizzing this little seven-year-old child. And of course, they're scared to death, typically, normally, all right? Um, but it's important for the child to be able to face a test like that. He's going to have to be, confess his sins to the priest in just a week or two after that. In the confessional, sure, there's a grill, and there's, but 
it's still a big thing. So it helps for the priest to be able to sit down with them and start going through who made you, why did God make you, all the little, you know, all the questions. Um, and sometimes you find really interesting answers. Like the one little boy I asked, um, this was back in Seattle. I said, why did God make you? To save all mankind from their sins. <laughs> he, just, he just got the wrong answer. I mean, it was, that was one of the answers, remember? That was why, that why the Son of God became man. Like, no, no, that's, that's, uh, that's not why God made you. Uh, a, little, I think a little precocious there. Um, or the little one who came in, are you nervous? And, nope, I've got two relics. And he had relics of the saints in his pockets. <laughs> he pulled them out. I said, all right, well, good. And as we started talking, I, uh, we started talking about firm purpose of amendment. And I said, well, firm purpose of amendment. For example, if you just broke a window in the house, you're not going to say, I'm sorry, Mom, and then smash, break another one. You're going you're gonna to show that you're sorry. You're going to not do that again. And he got real quiet. He was the son of a, of a Marine. And he, uh, he was a tough little kid. And he got real quiet. He goes, I broke a, I broke a window. I said, really? Yep, biggest one in the house. What were you trying to do? Trying to throw a rock over the house? <laughs> That'll do it. We went back and told his parents that I could read souls. Because I knew that he had broken a window. <laughs> that was the example I just happened to choose. He was the same, the same one that uh, when he wanted to serve Mass, his dad said, you think you're, you're tough? You think you're, you're good enough to serve Mass? You kneel. You lead the whole rosary. He was six years old. Then. You lead the whole rosary on your knees. You kneel on the coffee table because the, wood floor, the sanctuary floor is wood. And I need to see that you can kneel up the whole time. So you lead the rosary. You got him from the top of the coffee table and said, go ahead. Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. He goes on and on. Suffered under prison pirates. He <laughs> punches Pilate. What's a prison pirate? Well, I don't know. What's a punches pilate? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we quiz these little kids, right? And part of it, you get to a certain point, you say, all right. Venial sin or mortal sin? You just said that venial sin is a lesser sin. Mortal sin is a grave sin that kills the soul. So you tell me, is this a venial sin or a mortal sin? Uh, disobeying your parents. Venial sin? What if you do it on purpose? <coughs> mortal sin? Nope. Still a venial sin. But you've got to test it. You've got to, figure, you've got to help them see it because there is a difference between a deliberate venial sin and a quasi-deliberate venial sin. Every venial sin is, to some extent, deliberate. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a sin. There has to be some sort of knowledge, some sort of consent. It may be very, very little. It may be more done, done it may be something we fall into more out of surprise. But every sin has some sort of uh, choice. Right. Um, so a deliberate venial sin is it bad? It's much, much worse than a, than a venial sin of surprise. That's true. Is it still, you know, is it deliberate? It, it, because it's deliberate, does it make it mortal? No. If it, was a, if it was a small matter, if it was a venial matter, it's a venial sin, deliberate or not. It's a more serious venial sin, but it's still a venial sin. You can get some as well that think that, well, you know, Probably about a hundred venial sins would equal mortal sin. Add them up. No. In fact, sometimes that's how we that's how we treat things sometimes as parents or as, as educators. Well, you didn't just do this once, you did it again and again and again and again. And each time I reacted proportionately, but after a hundred times I blow up as if it was the end of the world. Venial sins don't add up. To make a mortal sin. Unless it's stealing lots of small thefts with a very clear amount of money that you intend to get to. So if I, I, I need a thousand dollars to fly to the Bahamas. And so I'm going to steal a little here and a little there and a little there until I get to a thousand. Alright, that's mortal. Because although each theft is venial in itself, the intention is great. But normally, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, there's a difference in, it's, there's a specific difference 
between a venial sin and a mortal sin. Venial sins are terrible. Mortal sins are treason. Venial sins are really a problem. But mortal sins are treason. It's like the difference between purposely breaking the speed limit and driving, really, you know you shouldn't be going 140 in a 110 zone. You feel like you've got control, but you know you shouldn't be doing that. You know the law is, is you know, 110. You know if you get pulled up, you're going to have, have quite a fine. But you're not going to be thrown on a country board. And that, it's all right. It's a problem. We're talking now on the civil side. If the state looks at you, that's a problem. Don't speed like that. You're going to get, you get a big fine. But you're not disowned from the country. You commit treason, and in normal days, you, they just shoot you. Because you, yeah, you, you create a rebellion against the, against the crime. That's it. And that's mortal sin. Mortal sin is treason. Now, it may be treason through weakness and fear. Right? Fear of, of, sometimes it's fear of embarrassment. Um, and so you compromise on something. Or sometimes it's, it's concupiscence and the passions. Um, it may be weakness more than, than hatred of God outright, but every mortal sin is a turn against God, turning your back on God. That's what we call aversio, which is what hatred means. Right? To turn one's back, to have an aversion from God. Often, of course, it's choosing it's not so much a matter of deliberately saying, I hate God. It's a matter of saying, I want this creature or this pleasure so much that I will do anything to get it. I know it's wrong, but right now I don't care. That's mortal sin. Of course, the conditions of a mortal sin, the matter itself must be seriously wrong. We must know it's seriously wrong, and we must give full consent. All right. So the, the, the three conditions for every mortal sin. All right. If it's not a serious matter to begin with, well, then it's not a mortal sin. All right. Unless I was convinced that it was, because of course sin is in the will. So if I was if I was convinced that Ash Wednesday was a holy day of obligation and I purposely missed it anyway, well, I thought it was, and I thought I was breaking a, a serious commandment. Sin is in the will. I committed. I, I would have committed mortal sin at that point. Okay? Um, so it must be seriously wrong. I must know that it's seriously wrong, and I must give full consent to it. Um, of course, knowing it's seriously wrong. Um, there too, we, we like to kind of do. Um, we're tempted to try to be our own lawyer and get ourselves off the hook somehow, right? And so the temptation some for some can be, well, look, I, I wasn't really thinking about how wrong it was at the time. And so I don't think, I, I know that in itself, now looking at it, I know that it was, it was gravely wrong, but, you know, I, I wasn't really, I didn't at the moment say, I know this is a mortal sin and I'm going to do it anyway. And therefore, in my case, it wasn't a mortal sin. That's not true. If you, if, if someone would have, if someone could ask you, ten minutes before that moment of passion, if someone could ask you, is this gravely wrong? And you could say, and you would able to say, yes, yes, that's a mortal sin. And it worked ten minutes, and if ten minutes after, you could say the same thing without having done research in a book. You know, yeah, that's a mortal sin. But at the moment, I wasn't thinking. Well, why weren't you thinking? Because the passions were going so strong and I just wasn't thinking and one thing led to another and whose fault is that? We, we know we have our knocking point. We're not allowed to let our passions get out of control like that. We have a strict duty to, to put a block there well before the, we get to a melting point. If we get to that melting point, that's our fault. And that's gravely wrong. It's a sin of weakness, but it's still gravely wrong if it was grave matter. All right, and then of course full consent. <clears throat> so knowledge uh, and full consent. 
mortal sin, for example, doesn't happen in sleep. Um, why? Couldn't consent to it. Mortal sin might happen before sleep. It might happen once you wake up. But mortal sin as such doesn't happen in sleep because there's not the consent in sleep. There could be, we could have set ourselves up for trouble um, if you went to sleep on the freeway and then you got smashed by a car, by a, by a, a truck. Well, whose fault is that? Yours. You chose to sleep there, right? So it could be something that you did that provokes problems in the night. Um, the, the problem would be what you did before or what you did once you get, once you get up, right? So that's, um, it, it just helps us to kind of narrow down <clears throat> the question of, of sin a little bit. What is sin? It's an act of base ingratitude. Ingratitude to God. Here I'd like to read a little bit of what um, Frank Sheed says about sin. He has a there, he has some good points here. He says, The essence of sin's gravity, as I have said, lies simply in its breaking of God's law. It is blank ingratitude to God, to whom all men Oh, so much, and to whom Christians know that they owe so immeasurably more than the rest of men. Sin is something terrible because it's an offense against our God. Every creature, therefore, who offends God does something terrible, but a Catholic who offends God, it's even more ingratitude because we've been given so much more. By God's grace, He has given us, he, God has given us so much more. And then He goes on. It is incredible stupidity. Sin is incredible stupidity. And it's true. Rebellion against God is one of the most ludicrous things in the world. For whether we are obedient or rebellious, we are at every moment totally in the hand of God. He made us of nothing. By His almighty power, He keeps us above the surface of our native nothingness. Without His concurrence, we could not act at all. We could not even defy Him. The sinner, as it were, stands up in the hand of God, sustained in being by that all-powerful hand, defying God, but in his very defiance, using the power which God has lent him, and which God could at any moment withdraw from him. It is true. Sin is so, if we could, could see it for what it is, it's so ridiculous. For us to, to defy and re rebel against the God who gives us existence to begin with. And yet we know it's... Um, it's very easy to fall if we're not careful. Why? Before we answer that, all right, I'll hand out a little, um, a little short, a short poem by a, a little-known author. You'll see why. And it's handed out. Um, because it does cover this question of sin. All right, the, the stupidity, the, the, um, the ridiculousness of sin. <laughs> it's called Sorrowful and Immaculate Queen. Allegiance to a queen unknown, for you and I are God, and God alone can fathom the holy trail she trod. All right, so speaking of Our Lady, of course, why, do we, why is she a queen unknown? Not because we don't know anything about her, but because, as the saints say, she is so far beyond us. She has been given so great, so many great privileges that only God Himself can fully understand our need. She is infinitely below God, but she is so far beyond us that only God Himself can fully understand her. So allegiance. Allegiance. Again, already, it's this loyalty rather than the treason. Allegiance to a queen unknown. For you and I aren't God, and God alone can fathom the holy trail she trod. 
Spotless is the heart that beats with love for love to reign, while we, our blood-stained creatures, behold how sin is insane. Right? To her heart, spotless ours, blood-stained. To slay the God who loves us, and thus his mother slay, by sin two hearts are open, sure as June doth fall away. Sacred heart, immaculate heart. Sacred heart, immaculate heart, yeah. Heart. And of course, June being the, the month of the Sacred Heart, and May being yeah. the month of the Immaculate Heart. So one sin slays two hearts. But opened too hath my heart been. Right? The, not only has the spear somehow pierced their two hearts, but, but recognizing it can pierce ours. But open too hath my heart been, by the sight of sorrow sown, and deep within this son's soul, she his triumph doth intone. Right? So we have to, I think, contemplating on the gravity of sin actually helps us a great deal to avoid it. Because if we see what it does, we see how it crucifies our, our God, we see how it, how it costs Our Lady uh, her, her very life at the foot of the cross, because Our Lord was worth more than her life to her. Um, well, understanding it helps us to to avoid it ourselves. And of course, that's the, the opening to the triumph of Christ the King in, in an individual heart. All right. Um, so, not only is sin, not only is sin an act of stupidity, it's also against our nature. There's a sense in which every sin is against our nature. Now granted, we often, when we speak of the sins against nature, we mean usually very specific types of sin, very specific types of lifestyle. Yes, those are truly sins against nature. Sins against the nature as God made it. Uh, married love is meant to be fruitful. It's meant to be open to life. That's why a man can't marry a man and a woman can't marry a woman. Because that's a fruitless love. It's not the way God made it. It's not what God made that pleasure for. It's not the way God made man and woman. Can there be temptation? Can there be inclination? Can it, well, yes, because we're fallen. But we have an obligation to fight that inclination. If it's a fallen, twisted inclination, we have to fight it. It's not, the inclination is not the sin, it's a temptation. And some have more temptations in some areas than others. And some of it can be whatever, hereditary or whatever. But to say, this is the way God made me, therefore I can give free reign to my passions in this area? No. Not any more than a drunk can say, I was born with it. A love of whiskey. Um, all right, you might like whiskey. All right, you get little children there, they walk around, you know, you see the little lush. You know, they, they walk around and you know, at, at a dinner party, and they go grab everyone's glass of wine and finish it off, and they're only um, Some just have more inclinations than others. Do they have to resist it? Yes. They have an obligation to resist it. So can there be someone who has an inclination that's against their nature? Yes. And they have to resist it. We can pity them for that inclination, just like you can pity the drunk who has such a hard time saying no to, to uh, excessive alcohol. To a point that many times they have to give up all alcohol or they can't stop. <coughs> because once they start, they can't stop. You could pity them and say, well, too bad for you, you can't control it. Because now you've, got to, now you've had to cut it off for the rest of your life. I can still enjoy a, a sip of whiskey once in a while. I, I, I feel for you. Sure, we can have compassion on them. But we can't say that because there's an inclination in us that God put it there, I can, I have, to, I, I'm, I should act on it. No. Again, it's, it's blaming God for our, for the, let's say at least the wounds in our nature. Now, remember, some wounds are in our are in our nature because we put them there. We've done bad things, and so it's easier and easier to do more bad things of the same sort. The more we fall. Right? The easier it is to fall in that direction again. 
the more we succeed in overcoming, all right, so the more vir the acts of virtue we perform, the easier it is to be virtuous, and therefore the easier it is not to fall. In a certain sense, our wounded nature is healed more and more as we perform acts of virtue and receive the sacraments. But we all have to fight our, our evil inclinations, and we have evil inclinations. We have to recognize them for what they are. So there are sins against nature in that sense. There's another broader sense in which every sin is a sin against nature. Why? Because we are rational animals, and sin is stupid. Sin is irrational. Every sin, therefore, in a certain sense, is against the nature that God has given us. It's a rebellion against our Creator, which doesn't make sense. Of course, these days, many people will try to excuse sin in one way, shape, or form by saying, oh, I'm just trying to express myself. It's self-expression. Not really. Your nature says that you should obey God. It's something twisted and fallen that says you should not. It's something weak that says you should not. So it's not self-expression. It's not expression of the nature of God. It's, it's selfishness. Uh, but that's our world. You know, we, we live in a very lost world. There are some things we just wouldn't do. I mean, I think if we could see, if we could see the how outmatched we are by God. We wouldn't dare. Right? But we do silly things. I remember one point, I remember at one of the schools I was teaching at in Idaho, there were, um, it was a boys' school, all boys' school, about 210 boys, K through 12. Um, at the time, I was principal of the high school. And um, there were uh, there were a couple of boys, and one of them, he was, he was a huge kid. His father had been a Green Beret. Um, he, this, this kid, he was 10th, 10th grade, I think, at the time. He was, he was huge. He could bench press everything we had. Um, the, the kid was just massive. And there was another, another boy who was, um, he was normal sized, but compared to this other kid, there's just no way that he was ever going to win a fight with him. And, um, and so this, the, the one, it was, it was, uh, I'll give names. Um, any case, so the one, all right, I come walking up to school one day and he's got a black eye, all right, the smaller of the two. I said, hey, uh, Nick, what, uh, what happened? And uh, I really had no I mean, I just saw he had a black eye. I thought, you know, poor kid, he must have, oh, well, you know, I was, I was, I can't remember, he had some explanation. I was coming up to the school and one of the other boys stuck out his hand at the same time as I came walking up and it caught me in the eye. Oh, well, I hope you feel better soon. And uh, I had no idea what really had happened. I go into the school and a little while later, one of the teachers comes to his father, I just thought you should know, yesterday, yesterday I was up here in my classroom, second story, and I could see him in that backyard, uh, you know, the side house that the parish owns. And two of our boys were out there with boxing gloves. I said, oh, was Nick one of them? Yeah, how'd you know? Well, look at his eye. You know, it's, <laughs> he's yeah. I said, who is he with? Oh, he was fighting Jim. Jim? Jim's huge. Why would this? <laughs> so, then what are you thinking? What are you doing? So, so I, I, pulled, I pulled Nick aside. I was doing soccer. And he was limping, too. So he's, he's limping around. And, uh, and he, but he's, he's like, so I go, hey, Nick, come here. Let's, we're going for a walk. My father, my legs kind of, I don't care if your legs hurt. We're going for a walk. And I, if you're going to be stupid, <laughs> I'm going to make you walk on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we start going for I, I, I kept them a good pace on purpose to make them all go along. So what's, you know, Nick, what really happened? Uh, no, what really happened? We were boxing. Why didn't you tell me that at the beginning? Well, I, I said, and who are you boxing? 
Jim, you know what kind of trouble we, the school can get into if you know there's a lawsuit of some sort or there's somebody really hurt and we don't have the You know what they can cost an insurance? So I give them the, the lecture. And then at the end of the whole thing, I'm like, so get, get back out there and play. And by the way, you know, don't be stupid. If you're going to box something, don't box Jim. <laughs> you know, come on. What are you thinking? <laughs> you just don't. You don't do it. You don't save someone on that's that much bigger than you are. You know, so, and yet we'll take on God when it comes to sin. It really is foolish. And we do have to see it that way. Um, of course, sin can be, it can be, well, of course, it's in the will. So, sin can be thought, it can be word, it can be action. It can be omission. Can you repeat that, sir? Yeah. So sin can be in thought, in word, in action, or in omission. Meaning fail, but having failed to act, having failed to do something. So really, you can we could commit a mortal sin in the mind without ever having done anything, ever having done an external action. Sin is in the will. Um, there could be a mortal sin of, of looking at something. Thought, word, deed, that's a type of deed. Omission. There can be a mortal sin, and of course venial sin too, but there could be a mortal sin of omission. You know, a parent who fails to raise their children Catholic. A Catholic parent who fails to raise their children Catholic. Mortal sin. If they grievously neglect that duty that they have to raise their children Catholic, it's a mortal sin. Um, a parent who grievously neglects to protect their child from the internet, for example, and gives their, you know, their 13-year-old daughter or son an iPhone, a smartphone without any restrictions, without, you know, with unlimited access to the internet anytime they want. I would say that they're failing in their duty as a parent to protect their child in a very serious area. I'm, I am afraid that many parents may end up in hell by omission. By having failed to set the parameters necessary to safeguard their children. Of course, some parents will try to say, well, you know, if my child really wants to find this bad stuff, they'll find it somewhere. You're right. If they really, if, if, a, if a human being really wants to find evil, they will find it. They will get around all the rules you set if they're determined to find it. But you still have to set the rules. You still have to put up the guardrails. You have to help them. You have to do everything you can. And you have to win their hearts. It's a duty of parents to win the hearts of their children. You can't, they have free, a child has free will, but you have to do all in your power to be able to win their respect and win their love because you're going to have to make some hard rules for them. And those rules, they'll just tend to go around them unless you've won their hearts. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I, 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 that's not just, it's not just parents. I mean, I would say it's one of the things as well that we really have a lot. There's, there, there's must be, there's, there should be a huge worry for the souls of the average clergy these days. There, there's a failure to speak about heaven and hell. There's a failure to speak about mortal sin. There's a failure to teach doctrine clearly. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying every priest in the diocese is on the way to hell. I'm not saying that. I, can't, I don't know each individual and how they're doing, but there are times where you look and say, this is a major, as a pattern, this is a major problem. And I can tell you as a traditional, you know, as a traditional priest, there are times that we run into souls, poor souls, who are in a habit of mortal sin, partly because at least, because some modern priests told them when they were a boy or a young girl that that's not a sin at all, or at most a venial sin. Things that are mortally sinful. And 
And so they've created habits and ways. And even when they want to change it, it's not easy. Who's going to answer to God for that? It's the priest's duty to speak the truth and to know moral theology. I heard of a priest not long ago who I, I haven't met this priest. So there's always possibility that, there, that someone um, is exaggerating an issue. But I heard, I heard not long ago that there's a priest, um, there's a diocesan priest somewhere here in Australia who refuses to give a penance in the sacrament of penance. Refuses. So the penitent comes and confesses, and then he doesn't give a penance. He'll give absolution, apparently, without a penance. And if they're out, if they say, well, you know, but Father, I want a penance. Apparently, he says, God's mercy. It's not just one father, there's, there's a few out there. It's completely against moral theology, completely against sacramental theology. What do we call it? The sacrament of, yeah, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Where, where were these men born? Do they believe? Or do they think they can just make up how the sacraments work? I, and I don't, I mean, it's just, this is the world we live in. So thought, word, deed, or omission. I don't remember which saint it was at the moment, but who said, on my deathbed, I fear not so much what I have done wrong as what I have left undone. The omission. Anytime you see sin happening, do you have to call it out? Ah. Or do you discern when you should call it out and when you should not call it out? Good question. So the, the question is, when you see someone else sinning, do, you, do we always have an obligation to call them out on it? And if we don't, is that a sin of omission? Right? So, and, and or do we have, are we supposed to discern each time? I would say, no, there's a certain discernment process that is um, proper. Um, there are times where fraternal correction is the right thing. There are times where it's an obligation. If you're the parent of that child, there are times where you're going to have to correct what you're seeing. All right? There are some times where you might tolerate a lesser evil all right, to avoid a greater evil. Even a parent, for example, if they corrected the child 17 times that day and they can tell the child is about to, to break, and the child is trying to get a, a reaction and wants it, an excuse to just completely lose it, right? The parent might, in all wisdom, notice a mistake and not show that he noticed because he's looking for the long-term good of that child, right? But normally, in normal circumstances, especially if it's a, more of a, if it's a bigger thing, a parent has an obligation to correct his own child um, a priest can have an obligation to correct a, 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 a one of his faithful, um, but you don't have to become the policeman of the world in the sense of having to, you know, in every circumstance, uh, you'd go into any mall and have to walk up to eat every, almost every woman and say, those pants are too tight, those pants are too tight, those, <laughs> I, I mean, you just couldn't do that. We call that the foot patrol, Father. <laughs> Well, <laughs> yeah. but when it comes to like your friends, for example, and I'm talking not like you know, but your like close friends, right? You have an obligation, right? Like if you love your friend, you want to get them to heaven, so you would have that obligation, right? There, there can certainly be an obligation in charity. Um, there's what, what we've been talking about, you know, a parent to his child. That's an obligation in justice. There can also be an obligation in charity where you look and say. I, I am not responsible for you, but I care so much about you that I'm going to do what I can. Now there's still, and that's another topic um, that could, we could look at at one point in more depth, but there are, there are still conditions and manners in which fraternal correction should be done um, when it's done. And fraternal correction is not an easy thing. But it is true that fraternal correction is, I think sometimes it's neglected. 
If we really love someone, you're right. We should try and we should look at their good. If they're really, we wouldn't correct everything, but at, we'd find the right moments to try to help them see the problem, the pattern of problems that they're, they're um, uh, falling into. There. So yeah. Um, when it comes to the question of sin, one of the difficulties is the fact that when we're sinning, we often don't recognize clearly, because we don't stop and think, we don't often recognize clearly just how problematic our choice is. Why? Because do we set out to choose evil? No. Our will is made for good. It can't grab hold of evil. It's like, can your eyes see the dark? Your eyes see light. When there's not darkness, they just simply don't see at all. They're made for the light. You know, black is not a color in that sense. Darkness is not a color. It's an absence. Right? So, does the will choose evil? No. The will chooses an apparent good. Something that looks good under a certain aspect to me now, but it's not good in itself. And that's the difficulty at the moment. We're choosing the evil, thinking this is really not necessarily morally good, but it tastes good or it feels good, or it, you know, there's something on the passion level or on the you know, on some other level that draws me to it. And I'm mesmerized by this little tiny good because it's close to me and it looks much bigger than the mountain in the distance. We we often our perception is thrown off. Whatever is closest seems biggest and most important. But it's not necessary. All right? You can look at two mountains in the distance and say, that one's much bigger, that one's much bigger than that one. Why? Because that one's further away. It looks smaller. But it might be much bigger than this one. The, the perspective makes a big difference. God is infinite goodness. This creature has some little element of goodness, but it looks much bigger to us than heaven at the moment of the sin. We know it forfeited. And we choose to do it. So apparent goods, we have to be careful about that. Don't think that you're, you know, well, as long as I recognize evil for evil, then slow down. Don't let your your judgment be overridden, over, you know, don't don't allow the the um, the passion to override the judgment. That's often what happens. We get those passions going and say, well, I don't, I don't want to think about that right now. I don't want to think about how bad it is. I don't want to stop. I don't even want to think about if it's bad. I just want, want, want this. Stop. Slow down. Get your bearings. Figure out where you are. Say a quick prayer. And, if, and, and then make a true choice based on your ultimate good. Not based on what would be, would give, you know, a momentary pleasure here and now. Oh, I have a question. Yeah, um, just going back to the omission, Father. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it will come to a level of discernment as well. Is it possible that that omission can turn into actually facilitating someone else's sin? An example is, say, if you had a family member who was living with their partner who's not married. Yeah. I understand that you probably shouldn't be going over to their place. Yeah. But should you be hanging around with them together? Like, would that be condoning their relationship? Or should you just... Right. It's going to depend a little bit on, on the circumstances. Um, you're, if, if they could get married one day, and you're hoping that they will get married and they're on that path, right, you might keep enough contact with them in social settings that you can be a help to them and push them towards marriage. But I would agree that to go spend a night, for example, at their house of sin, because that's what it is, no, that condones their living situation. You're going into their home, which they shouldn't be living in together because they're not married in the eyes of God. Right? So you can't condone that. Um, you get some who go even a step further, and then it's act. So they'll go to the wedding, the remarriage of someone, when they've already been married before, and their first spouse is still alive. And... Well, but for the sake of the family peace, no. 
for the sake of the salvation of their soul, tell them that you cannot come. You hate. You, you don't want to hurt their feelings. That's not your intention. But you know they're going to be hurt because you've got to say that they're not being. They're not truly going to be married in the eyes of God. I can't celebrate this. And some would try to say, well, all right, I won't go to the wedding. I'll just go to the reception and celebrate their life of sin. No. You don't go to the, if you can't go to the wedding because it's invalid, then you can't go to the reception and you can't give them a gift. Because it's not anything to celebrate. On the contrary. No one's trying to say we hate these people. It's because we love these souls and we love God that we have to say, no, that's gravely wrong. And we more and more these days it's like that because the world is so broken. So no, it's a good question. Omission can become a, a mortal sin. Um it just, you know, it's it's not that we're always going to be able to spell out everything at once. But you have, you have to look at what is my duty to this soul, and how what's the what's the greatest amount of good that I can do right now. I can tell you as a priest that many times when we travel or we, you know we, we fly to one point or another, you sit down and if someone actually wants to start talking to a priest about their soul, all right, or about their life, often you know it can be someone who's not a Catholic at all, and they start bringing up. You know, their belief about the Bible and their belief about this part of the Bible and their belief about marriage and their belief about... And they just start rattling on about it. And it, as they talk about their own life, as a priest, there are times you look and say, hey, if I was going to correct every mistake in their life, everything that they're saying, I mean, we wouldn't get past a couple sentences. Because you constantly stop. Actually, let me give you, explain the whole theology about that. No, stop. Let me explain the whole... You couldn't do it. So you have to sit there and you have to, you, you cannot condone. So you don't say, oh, that's you know, good for you. Good for you. No, you can't do that. Um, you get this expression in Australia that's, that's rather helpful. You know, oh, fair enough. Which just means I understand what you're saying. I don't accept um, it. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> What's that? I don't accept it. Yeah, I understand. Exactly. I understand. Yeah. I understand. I understand what you're saying. I don't, I'm not saying I like it. Um, fair enough, actually, in America. Don't say it in America. To be fair enough, in America, probably would mean I agree with you. Um, here in Australia, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Right? It's, it's really just, I get, what you're, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. It's also a good one when you're kind of over with the conversation. You're like, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> Catch you later. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard, though, because you have to walk that, you have to basically say, all right, I want, not walk the line, you're saying, I want to help this soul. I cannot, this soul is obviously way off track. I, but I, I want to help where I can. I cannot condone any of the evil, but I can't correct all of the evil at once either. You'll just simply threaten them all. And so you look and say, all right, well, let me look for God's grace. Let me see where God wants me to, where there's an opening, and I'll correct that. And I'll correct this, yeah. One thing um, when it comes to like the sin, sin of omission and like, duty to correct people after discerning it and so on. Mm -hmm. One thing that because uh, I, I go to university and oftentimes in classes I want to hang out with students all of them are using the Los in vain obviously. Yeah. Because that's something really common and uh, that's something I've thought about a lot. It's like do, do I correct these people because then they'll just probably laugh it off and then have um, it, it's like um, do you go in and try to correct them on things that they aren't going to understand and they're going to ridicule it if you do? Or right. do you wait until someone, you can sense that they've got no. some sort of sense of wanting to understand and yeah. then do you correct? Yeah, it's a very good question. It's not always easy. Um, I would say firstly, a, a big part of what, a big way in which we are called to be a living correction to the world is by our example. So if you at uni are consistent, if you're known for not using our Lord's name in vain, you're known, I mean, they, that doesn't mean that, you're, that people are talking about it, but everyone knows you don't talk like that. Often they will even be more careful when they're around you. Not always, but often. That's already, you're correcting without saying a word, all right? So because you can just somehow exhibit, hold yourself in such a way that others are lifted up, um, that does go very far. There are still times where you'll have to say something. So there are times where Christ is directly attacked, not just the loose, you know, not just loose speech, 
if God's name in vain as an expression or most of the time, yeah, yes, it's disrespectful, but it's not intended outright usually as disrespectful of God. It's usually used as, you know, whatever, some sort of fear or um, surprise or they're attacking someone else. They're, they're rarely, they can, all right, but they're rarely attacking our Lord himself. But if they're actually attacking our Lord or his mother, all right, in their in their terminology, and let's say they're, they're actually saying the Blessed Virgin Mary is not, you know, she's not a perpetual virgin. She's not, and, and they're attacking, 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 you know, in front of you with, you know, expecting you to accept. There can come a point where you have to stand up and say, whether they're going to ridicule you or not, you have to say, you know, I don't accept that. That's not true. Um, at the same time, you have to do it for the sake of the others who are listening, right? Even if this person's never going to be, their heart's never going to change, someone else might look and say, oh, someone stood up for her. Someone does believe. I have to look into this more, right? So there can be circumstances. Many times when it comes to just the bad language and everything else, I think, um, I think we can actually add fuel to the fire if we're bringing it up every time someone slips and says a bad word. All right, or, or misuses God's name. If every time we bring it up, sometimes that, that sparks just a tirade of the same language, right? So we have to be careful. Um, it's it's going to be different, I think, in different circumstances. I would say probably it's different between a, a man's workplace and a woman's workplace many times. With a group of men, you got to be careful because they'll just turn on you and they'll just use it again and again. What they'll try to do often is they'll try to bait you and pull you into their conversations, especially if they're if they're lewd conversations. And that's where you have to be really strong and say, no, I will not go that way. Because they're looking for a Catholic who is known for strength to slip into it as well. It somehow justifies them in their positions. See, even the Catholics talk like that. Or even they'll laugh at a joke like that. Or So we have to be strong. But a lot of it's by who you are more than by what you say. Sometimes it's by what you say. Um, I would say there can be circumstances where um, you let certain things go for a time, all along, looking and saying, one day I hope to get to have enough of a rapport with this individual that they trust me enough that when one day I pull them aside away from everyone else and say, you know, I really don't appreciate it when you talk like that. Um, it's, uh, I really find it offensive. What, that at that point, you've already walked up to it and they're ready to listen. It's, you're looking at the long-term goal, right? Um, sometimes you, you can't, again, you can't condone evil. Um, and if they were coming into your home and scandalizing your kids, suddenly the, the necessity is much higher. If you invited a friend over in, their, in your house and they're, they're talking like that in front of your kids, you might not have the leisure to get to know them better. You might have to just pull them outside and say, look, you stop talking like that, or you're gonna you're gonna have to leave. I, you can't be talking like that in front of my, my children. Yeah. Yes. Um, going back to the Lord's name in vain. One of the other ways you can use His name in vain is if you call yourself a Christian, but you don't live out the Christian life. So in terms of like paternal correction for a Christian, would it be more like I guess <coughs> more frequent or more stern with someone who is purporting to live a Christian life because they're kind of scandalizing. The Christian name, as opposed to someone maybe who's secular, or atheist, or whatever it might be. Yeah, it, yeah, it can be. I mean, you probably have more um, leverage, and it's true that they're, in a certain sense, a worse example, um, especially if they're Catholic. I mean, like a, a Nancy Pelosi who's mm. promoting abortion. You wouldn't go. It's wrong for anyone to promote abortion, but for for a Catholic to promote abortion, you know, somebody's got to say something. Right? So yeah, it can be that because of their position, we have to say something like that. It's actually um, just reminding me of something that like oftentimes when you talk to people about uh, church teaching, oftentimes they'll dismiss it because in their mind they've heard so many priests say it and they've heard so many other Catholics say it and they've seen it from Catholic websites. So they think, well, the, if, if everyone agrees with it, then it can't be condemned. Yes. And then now yes. we live that way. Yeah. Well, and that's where I think the conscience ends up getting um, blurred in the minds of many. I think there is, there's a, although we, you know, when it comes to talking about sin, we try to spell it out as clearly as we can, what is morally sinful in itself and what is not. But 
in these days there's so much confusion that remember that this is God's law can shine down on our human soul but if our human soul is distorted and troubled you're not going to get the reflection of, of God quite as clearly look at the moon all right on a, on a clear night where there's no wind the, the moon reflects off the, the lake and you can see almost a perfect moon in the lake but if there's a little bit of a breeze you'll you'll see a distorted view of the moon and if there's a big breeze you'll just see little spots of light there's still something there the world around us still has something of something reflecting from god's law but often it's very troubling and so it's for god to sort out exactly what's guilty and what's not as far as subjectively but we have to be very clear about what's right and wrong objectively because it's not just a subjective thing the individual sin or soul is at stake and god will judge that we have to be able to say this is according to god's law as such and this is not and i think we have to we probably at one point we should go back through and just remember what are some of the things that the world looks at as fashionable or normal that in fact are mortal sins i mean i'm thinking like yes Sorry, I, was I was thinking like you know drunkenness i'm um, true drunkenness where you the loss of use of one's reason that's mortal sin Mortal sin, um, drugs. So alcohol can be used in moderation. Drugs can. Drugs hard, soft, mortal sin. Um, because again, it impacts the reason. We can talk about how it does it differently than the, than the alcohol, but it still does it. Um, because it's different, people tend to think, "Well, I, I remember everything, so it's not a big deal." No, it is a big deal. And this is we can talk about why at one other time, another time. But drugs, alcohol, missing mass on Sunday through our own fault. How many modern Catholics know that that's a mortal sin? But it is. It is. Missing Mass on Sunday through our own fault. Mortal sin. Breaking our communion fast and still going to communion anyway. Knowing mortal sin. Um, not observing the fast and abstinence on, on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday in particular. Yeah. Just on that, how recent or how frequent does an, uh, what do you call it, an absolution of, or, you know, a, Mitigating the fast like a priest kind of gives you mitigating the uh, the fast for example pre communion fast like uh, they they sanction a you know essentially a breaking the fast like you've eaten within the hour for example or whatever it might be and the priest I don't think it's within the power of the priest to give that dispensation for the for a communion fast now a priest can make a judgment and say this person has a physical condition that of sickness whereby they they could we could apply to them like we can on the sick call, where they don't have to make the fast because they're in a nursing home, they can't control their own meals, and the priest turns up when he turns up. Well, that ill person doesn't need to fast. That's built into canon law. That's built into the law of the church. Well, I was going to say, like a bishop, like, I mean, you raised it actually once about uh, your superior, um, I don't know what the word is, like absolving or mitigating your responsibility. Dispensation. Dispensation, sorry. Um, for example, not uh, praying the office. Uh, for priests that uh, give them dispensation from praying the office for a short time or whatever it might be. Like, I thought there was the same power there for the priests or bishops to give to right. the laity in certain circumstances. It's yeah. not it totally depends on the law. The priests can't yeah. just change general law yeah. in every regard. Mm -hmm. um, there can be certain laws that a parish priest is allowed to dispense and others that it's not. Um, but Look, I've, had that, I've, had, that, I've had that done before, so I'm just trying yeah, to... Yeah, no, I would say... And I've, I've heard of it done before too. I've never read anywhere where it says a priest can just say, this healthy individual can go to community even though he hasn't passed at least one hour. So I, yeah, I think we just have to say no. Now, can a priest say, um, under certain, your parish priest say under certain circumstances you don't have to abstain on this day, or you don't have to fast because... He's an underground master during lockdown. Okay. Um, it was yeah. under those... Well, uh, yeah, I mean, the circumstances are... But yeah, I don't... In Universal law, yeah. because you're not obliged to go to communion to begin with. You want to Correct. go to communion, I, yeah. that's a great thing, but we're not obliged to go to communion on any particular day. Yeah. Um, so to suddenly say, well, you don't have to fast at all for this man, for this communion, because it just came up. Yeah. I wouldn't do it. Um, if he's got, a, if he can find a law, and maybe he can, but if he can find something that's clear from the church, and it could be something local, it could, it could be something here in Australia. The priest is allowed to anticipate not only mountains but lawns the day before. Why? Because it was a missionary field. It was, you know, it was allowed because of the, the, the travels. 
It was allowed at a certain point in the history of Australia, and it was never revoked, so it still applies today. There can be particular laws, but I don't know of any here. How do you find them? Because they're not exactly codified in yeah, some form. I guess you have to ask the priest who gave it to you. So far, where did you get it? Look, he's a good priest. I'd be surprised if it was like a. Well, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't expect yeah. he meant ill. Yeah. Somebody, someone can give a, a permission they think they can give mm -hmm. without knowing that they're actually going above their pay grade. Yeah. Okay. No, <laughs> I mean, the Pope made the law. Yeah. I don't feel like I can just dispense of it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, just to expand on uh, something you were talking about before, uh, about talking to someone about what's right and wrong. Uh, when someone doesn't have a moral theology, like they're not of the faith, they're not Catholic, they're not Christian, they're secular, atheist, whatever it is they may be, everything they view as right and wrong can be completely upside down to us. Yeah. Uh, we can't just tell them, oh, because it's, Christ has said this in Scripture, or because the church teaches this, that in their view is an acceptable one because they don't have uh, the faith. So everything that they view is, is based on either their passions or what's their natural law. Okay. Uh, how do you argue with someone wrongly? How, do you, how do you oblige? To, I guess, turn the other eye and not say anything to them, or are you supposed to correct them? How do you correct them when, when your line of thought is completely oblivious, to, like as in over their head? Right. I mean, sometimes you're going to have to, you have to just, just like they're willing to say, I disagree with you. I think this is normal. I think this is okay. Sometimes you're just going to have to look back at them and say, Well, I disagree with you, and I don't think it's okay. I mean, sometimes you're just going to have to be honest and say, No, I, I do think you're wrong there. Um, and I base my belief on natural law, and I base my belief on what Christ taught. I know you don't believe in Jesus Christ, but I do, and I do believe that he's right on this. Um, so sometimes we won't be able to win the, actually win his submission, but we still have to stand up for the truth. Other times we can start, you know, we can, we can show the, the lack of logic in their conclusion. All right? If, for example, if divorce and remarriage is allowed, where does that end? Who suffers through that? You know, you think I should have to stay with someone that I don't love anymore and the rest of my life I'm stuck in. You think your kids should be bounced around from house to house, sometimes multiple sets of parents because their, their mother or father's been married and remarried and remarried and remarried. And you think that's all right? Where is this going to go? You know, I mean, it's so sometimes we have to, we have to turn it. We have to, we have to continue on and, and show that the, the lack of logic and other times, I think we have to we have to just call them out and say, "So you really, you know, you're saying that I'm that I'm backward. I'm, you know, do you really have that much disrespect for the whole history of mankind that you think that for the first time in thousands of years, we, this generation, which is such a mess, has gotten it right? No one ever saw this until now. These people could, you know." They had knowledge, they had, sure they didn't have they had all the science in every regard, but look at the great feats these men and women did in the past, and you're just going to say, everyone behind was that they were backwards and nothing. You don't think there's a little pride there? <laughs> you know, I, I, think, I think we've got to call them on sometimes, but I know what you mean. Sometimes it's a really, it's a hard battle. Um, because it's, it's a whole worldview that you're trying to fight, and you don't have to change that over. Um, all right, we are, it's, that's good. See, as soon as we get on topics like this, the questions can just be multiplied. Um, and they are good. So it's not, I mean, I'm opposed to coming back to it at one point if there are further questions, but we're five minutes in front of Ah, so after the meal, Mr. I'm sorry, after the meal, after the, after the, I think we called past that. Conflict, <laughs> there's going to be a meal at Mr. Sadi's. He's going to write his address up on the whiteboard so that no one uh, misses it this time. Um, and if you want, if you want to uh, drop over there some, for some paella, you're welcome to do so. All right. Once in the beginning, he is now and never shall be, Lord, without any all right, good. Come back with all your friends next time. There's a little. Thank you.